we're actually in this really weird and, and kind of exciting and perhaps perilous period where there's not one, but several new technologies all emerging at the same time. So the first of these is blockchains. Blockchains are the first digital medium for value. They are ushering in a new era of the internet. But the second big technology, of course, is AI. We're in this period where uh, computers are really allowing us to reimagine or to rethink what we thought technology could do and what people could do <clears throat> when empowered with these kinds of tools. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Alex here. Uh, Alex, you've now written multiple books. You've thought very, very deeply about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, AI, where the world is headed. Um, and I thought maybe what we could do is just like, where are we in the adoption of these new technologies that are going to change the world and they're going to kind of revolutionize our daily lives? Um, if we think of maybe Bitcoin to start, like where are we in that adoption cycle and, and how much have we actually fulfilled the promise of what Bitcoin actually has provided? Well, I think overall, we're still pretty early. Bitcoin is an asset class is widely held by a lot of people as a, as a store of value, um, but is not used as often as a medium of exchange. And I think that is in large part a function of the fact that we're still early in the adoption curve. But in a lot of other respects, um, you know, Bitcoin's made an enormous progress. You mentioned that I've written a couple of books on this. You know, I, like a lot of people, got into this space 2014, 15 with Bitcoin. This is well before the word blockchain or Web3, you know, entered the vernacular. There was this one asset. And at first I thought I was investigating a new financial technology, but I kind of quickly realized that uh, Bitcoin and the underlying blockchain was, was a general purpose technology that could potentially usher in a new era of the web. And at the time, the value of, of Bitcoin was, I think, like five or six billion dollars. There were some other coins around at the time. You know, I think Litecoin had launched by then, Ripple and others. But we're talking like ten billion dollars. So to put that in perspective, that's smaller than the market cap of like Under Armour or The Gap. Like if Bitcoin was... <laughs> was a publicly traded company, it wouldn't have made this S&P 500, right? It would have been considered like a small cap. So very early, and now you fast forward to today, the assets over a trillion, the whole market cap of the asset class is uh, near, near to $2 trillion. And I think that Bitcoin and blockchain is really starting to shake the windows and rattle the walls of a lot of industries. And the longer it lasts, the more likely it is to succeed and to continue to grow. So I think it's uh, it's um, anti-fragility has been one of its great strengths. And I think that it's got uh, a bright future. What do you think are the areas that Bitcoin needs to most improve? You mentioned medium of exchange. Are there other things that you see as uh, either areas of improvement, maybe potential headwinds uh, that, that need to kind of be navigated uh, or potential pitfalls, things as to why it could fail or big risks that are, lay on the horizon? Well, I've been a big Bitcoin fan for a long time. You know, I uh, wrote a book about the technology in 2015. A few years ago, launched one of the first ETFs on the Toronto Stock Exchange. People don't know this, but Bitcoin and Ether ETFs have been allowed in Canada since 2021. We raised over $200 million in that financing. So I've always been a big fan, but yeah, there are definitely limitations today still to, I think, it fulfilling its uh, potential. I think that right now, this renaissance that we're seeing of layer twos built on Bitcoin and of NFTs and other functionality, I think is something that should be welcomed. I think it's a very exciting development, but I know that there are some people in the community who view it basically as, you know, kind of network clutter. Um, as you know, crowding out block space for other kinds of better transactions. And I think that's a flawed way of thinking. I think that if you want a technology to succeed, and by definition, you know, Bitcoin is a technology, an open technology, then you have to allow all sorts of open innovation and exploration and innovation. So to me, that is number one, which is that let Bitcoin be Bitcoin, let uh, the platform be used as both a media of, of exchange and store of value, but also as a general purpose technology, which is frankly what got a lot of people into this space way back in the day. Um, and then I think obviously we need to just continue to make it easier for people to onboard to the technology. And I think that's something that we're already seeing play out. You know, I interviewed Alex Gladstein from uh, the Human Rights uh, foundation relatively recently, and he provided some interesting data. What he says basically is that, you know, there's like the, the golden billion, right? People in the world who live in places like the States, like you or Canada, where I live, or maybe Western Europe, Japan, and a couple of other places who have access to financial services, who aren't worried about governments expropriating their money, um, who, you know, don't worry about hyperinflation. Inflation is a problem, but hyperinflation. But then the remainder of the world lives in a place where access to financial services is spotty, where it's difficult to find um, ways to store 
and move value and where local institutions, including governments and banks can be very corrupt. So that is the area where you're actually seeing the greatest adoption so far of Bitcoin, but also Web3 more generally, including you know, applications like stable coins, for example, or DeFi or even NFTs. You know, NFT adoption is higher in places like the Philippines and, and Thailand than it is in the United States. Stablecoin adoption is higher in places like Turkey and Nigeria than it is in Germany or the United Kingdom. Uh, ownership of Bitcoin is higher in places like Venezuela than it is in places like uh, you know, Canada, for example. So all of these different examples have something in common, which is that these are parts of the world where um, access to finance is spotty, where access to economic opportunity is spotty, and the ability to plug into a permissionless network or, or network of networks, including Ethereum and others, um, is a superpower, right? Um, it's a way to put yourself on a more level playing field with other people around the world. And so I see that as being the primary driver, but st even still today, it's relatively um, small scale. So to me, that's very exciting because it means that there's still uh, quite a runway ahead of us. Now, when you look at um, kind of the next epoch or so, if you will, of uh, the crypto industry, we went from Bitcoin uh, and this you know great innovation on technology uh, with blockchain technology. Then we added in smart contracts, and that led to this explosion of activity, excitement, uh, innovation, etc. What's interesting to me is uh, those early versions have continued to gain steam. They continue to be bigger assets, more developers, uh, more activity. And now also Bitcoin is starting to borrow some of those ideas and try to bring it back to Bitcoin as well. And so talk about kind of that maybe second bucket, which is a lot of the smart contract platforms, a lot of these decentralized applications, et cetera, which I think really this uh, last book that you wrote um, is kind of more focused on, uh, you know, trying to unpack what's happening in that part of the industry. Yeah, absolutely. So my new book is called Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural Frontier. And the book basically explores how blockchain and, and other technologies are converging to create a new kind of internet and a new kind of web. You know, every once in a while, a new technology emerges that changes the world, transforms the economic power grid and the old order of human affairs. And we've seen that in history, you know, the rise of the computer before that, the television, the radio, the internal combustion engine and so forth. And I think today, we're actually in this really weird and, and kind of exciting and perhaps perilous period where there's not one, but several new technologies all emerging at the same time. So the first of these is blockchains. Blockchains are the first digital medium for value. They're ushering in a new era of the internet. And in the same way that a, the Bitcoin network allows you to move and store value in Bitcoins, blockchain networks like Ethereum allow you to basically move and store value uh, in any kind of asset, right? Tokens are like websites for value. They can be programmed to represent basically anything, stocks, bonds, votes, titles, deeds, art, you name it. But the second big technology, of course, is AI. We're in this period where uh, computers are really allowing us to reimagine or to rethink what we thought technology could do and what people could do <clears throat> when empowered with these kinds of tools. Then you've got the rise of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, or what, what's now known as extended reality. This Apple Vision Pro, I don't know, do you have one of these things yet? Uh, I don't have the Apple Vision Pro, uh, but I've tried some of the other, you know, the Oculus and, and many others, which uh, almost seem like, you know, cheap man versions uh, at this point of uh, how good the Apple Vision Pro is. Seems like that. And maybe we're like one more iteration away from this becoming a mass market product. But it's pretty clear, at least to me, that the Internet is moving from a two dimensional medium to a spatial web, right, to a three dimensional Internet. And that can include... Um, you know, virtual reality where we're consuming content, we're in virtual worlds, but also the web itself being imprinted on our physical landscape. And then the final of these technologies is, you know, the Internet of Things. And that's a term that's been around for a while, but I'm not talking about, you know, smart home monitors or things that measure your glucose. I'm talking about devices that can think and can do transactions thanks to AI and blockchain. So all of these technologies are coming together. And my view basically is that in the, in the way that the term Internet, you know, went from describing a pretty narrow set of technologies that were involved in like networking to describing much more than that. Like I think when we use the term internet, we're talking about new business models, new cultural behavior, other technologies, you know, smartphones, the cloud, web browsers, and so forth, um, and even new social behavior, all of these kinds of things. Like we consider all that the internet. To me, web three is about the convergence of these technologies. Blockchain is clearly the most important. It's foundational to all of this. But I think that um, as time progresses, we're going to stop talking about there's the Web3 bucket and the AI bucket and the this bucket and the that bucket. And we're going to see it all as coming together as uh, under one umbrella. Now, when you see um, 
this kind of uh, explosion of innovation and the melding of it together, are there one or two examples that you point to where you're like this specific application or this specific development really highlights how entrepreneurs or builders are going to leverage all of this to build things that solve a problem for someone? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so my background is in financial services. You know, I worked in investment banking, what some of what people would call, you know, TradFi <laughs> nowadays. Um, and so when I first looked into this, I thought I was investigating a financial technology, not a general purpose technology. And I still think that in financial services, that's where a lot of the rubber is really hitting the road. I think that stable coins, for example, are a clear product market fit where everyone in the world wants a way to move and store US dollars but the majority of them can't access a US dollar bank account. Enter stable coins, which give people a way to do that. It's a US dollar utility that's now uh, widely used in many different parts of the world. And so I think of that as an interesting example. Stable coins are also an on-ramp to DeFi and to other uh, financial sort of primitives that are being developed in the world of Web3 that give people a way not just to move value, but to to store it, to access credit, to you know, fund and develop uh, new investments uh, and new companies, to insure against risk, to organize financial information, and, and so on and so forth. And it's in that world of what's known, you know, colloquially as DeFi, that I see a lot of really exciting innovation. But what's really interesting to me about um, Web three isn't just the way in which it sort of creates new ways to do things that we do today but in the way in which it maybe creates things that weren't possible previously. And so I think about the rise of AI and the rise of Web3 or, or blockchain and how these things are, are converging. And we've done a lot of work at the, on this. You know, um, I'm a co-founder of the Blockchain Research Institute, which has conducted over 150 projects looking at you know, the convergence of technologies like AI and blockchain and others. And I think basically at every single level, of the AI stack, there is an opportunity to introduce um, blockchains and to introduce these Web3 primitives. Um, and I won't go into them in too much detail, but you may have already covered on the show this whole notion of decentralized physical infrastructure. That basically, in order to fulfill the promise of AI, and frankly, the metaverse and all these other things, we're basically going to need as much computing powers as humanly possible. We're going to need to marshal all the resources at our disposal. But we also wanna make sure that these algorithms and applications aren't all controlled by a few very large companies that manage the clouds, right? The computing power that, that uh, enable them. And so uh, enter decentralized physical infrastructure. So there are really interesting projects like the Akash network, for example, or the render network um, that we feature in the book, where basically you create an incentive to pool computing resources together. And these decentralized clouds, in many cases, can outperform uh, centralized clouds. They can do so at lower cost, but they also decentralize power in a way that I think creates a better footing for the industry to grow. So I think that's one area that, to me, is very, very fascinating. And then another one that, that I'm very interested in is culture, cultural industries. You know, um, for, for centuries, technology has been a tailwind for creators. For, for cultural creators, right? You know, in the medieval times, not to go too far back in history, but in medieval times, we used to uh, basically rely on, on patrons to support great cultural works, you know, the Medicis or the King of England or something like that. And oftentimes the art reflected the goals and the ambitions of the patron, right? There were tools of political power as much as they were expressions of creativity. And in the industrial age, finally, we had ways for creators to sell their works one to many. So they could you know, make a lithograph or sell a paperback novel or later cut an LP or sell a CD and so forth. And the 20th century to me sort of in a way is, is a golden era for creators where they didn't earn the majority of the income, but they got to participate in the creation of wealth from selling one to many, right? So if you're a, you know, a songwriter and you wrote a hit single and sold a million copies, you could expect to make about 50 grand, right? 5% if those singles sold for a buck a piece, back when people used to buy records. <laughs> but these days, technology is less of a tailwind and it's more of a headwind. So number one is the web was supposed to make it easier for creators to access their fans and to cut out the middlemen. And this is something that was part of the big promise of, of web one, right? Of the first era of the web. But the only problem is web one and the internet as we know it, isn't a medium for value. It's a medium for information. 
So the web took this thing that was an asset, like a CD or record that you could sell copies of and turn it into basically a printing press for information where you could make copies and copies and copies and the value that you received went to basically zero. So the web itself has become a problem um, for creators and now platforms sit in the center and uh, ensure that creators get less and know less about how their work is monetized than ever before. And now you've got the rise of AI. So I'm not an AI doomer. I don't know how you feel about this. I'm personally very bullish on AI, but a lot of estimates that I've uh, read say that, you know, in, in a few years time, 90%, maybe more of all content that we see is going to be synthesized, right? Whether it's film or TV or music, but it's going to be based on data, based on um, learning from existing IP, right? From the work of existing creators. So in that environment, we need to create ways for uh, those who create cultural content to get paid fairly. NFTs are an area that I'm really excited about and have been, uh, notwithstanding the ups and downs of the market. I think the idea of being able to prove ownership of a cultural artifact is an incredibly empow empowering and pow powerful <laughs> technology and innovation. And I see uh, lots of other ways in which creators can, can benefit. Um, you know, we have this way to trace and track the movement of value in these networks on on chain, and we should be able to do the same thing for for IP, for royalty rights, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of really interesting. I read a recent re research report that that sh shared uh, shed some light on this. That basically 1,500 patents have been filed for blockchain and AI, and a lot of this is around data integrity and and ensuring creators get paid. And it's still early. Like I don't want to overpromise on this, but it's an area that I'm very excited about as well. When you think about the different technologies, um, nomenclature seems to be something that gets highly debated. So if I'd say to someone, hey, is the metaverse going to be a thing? All of a sudden you get very, very controversial, highly debated uh, responses. Some people are yeah. big bulls. Some people are big bears. If I say to you, do you think that you know, AR, VR is going to be a thing? Some of the people who say no to the metaverse may say yes to AR, VR. And yeah. now it kind of looks like those things are actually going to be the same thing uh, in a weird way. And so how is a uh, individual who thinks through building companies, writing books, investing capital, how do you kind of clear out noise from signal and really evaluate what is the thing that people are talking about and will it be valuable in the future or not? Well, it's a terrific question. And it's something that as a person who writes books about this, I think about a lot because I think if everyone's <laughs> not on the same page, no, no pun intended, to start, then it makes the discussion really difficult to have. And I think that the metaverse is a perfect example of this. So I don't know that people have a clear definition of what that is. I think for a lot of folks, when they think about the metaverse, they think about uh, donning a headset, putting on a virtual reality or, or augmented reality headset, and entering some virtual space where they go to be entertained, to play games, to socialize, to spend money, to occupy their time, right? And I think a lot of times when we think about this, we're imagining a world that is curated or enabled by some big company like Facebook, Meta, or by Apple, or by Microsoft, you know? Eventually there'll be a headset that allows you to access the Xbox library and so on and so forth. Um, to me, this is not, the metaverse. You know, the metaverse concept comes from a book called Snow Crash. And there have been lots of examples throughout history where people have explored this idea of a virtual alternate reality. Sometimes it's sort of benign. Um, sometimes it's really cool, like Ready Player One. Um, sometimes it's very scary, like The Matrix, right? Um, this idea that we're plugged into this sh shared reality that keeps us um, from seeing the world as it truly is. But ultimately, what, what the metaverse is to those people into those companies is basically like a virtual world where you go, where you, where you spend money, where you play, where you interact, um, but you don't really own your own assets. You don't control your own identity. You don't have privacy. Anything you buy or earn in those environments can't be taken with you outside. Um, they're closed and they're gated communities, basically. They're walled gardens. So to me, that's not really like the metaverse, um, even the, the positive or the negative version. To me, that's just virtual Disneyland. It is a, you know, a theme park a place where you go to to play by the rules of some company, have fun, enjoy yourself. And at the end, you leave kind of with nothing. <laughs> um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with theme parks. You know, I've heard Disneyland is very fun. I haven't been since I was a little kid. But basically, like, if we're trying to create some new shared reality to fulfill some vision, to give the metaverse a second life, if you will, then we need to get some things right. 
And I don't think any of these visions really contemplate that at all. And the good news is that we actually have a very simple template to do that. It's called the real world. So the three things I think we need to actually create the metaverse or to fulfill the vision is number one, a reasonable right to privacy. I think that that right, which is protected by law and the constitution in the United States and in Canada should extend to the virtual world. You shouldn't have in companies that support you know, your experience online shouldn't have perfect vision into every bit of information about you. Number two is that you need to have property rights, right? You need to have the ability to own and control your own assets. And that's something that we already have, you know, in the real world, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Property rights are foundational to the liberal capitalist democracies that we all enjoy today. Um, that doesn't really exist online. You know, people spend $100 billion a year on virtual goods and experiences and so forth that they buy, but they don't actually own. At best, they're renters, but really they're just borrowing it for a period of time. So we need to have a way to enshrine digital property rights. The good news is that blockchains allow us to do that, right? We can own our own Bitcoin. We can control and own our own stable coins. We can also own and control our own digital identities, our virtual goods, things we buy and earn in environments like um, virtual worlds and so on and so forth. So all of this now exists to add an ownership layer for the web. And that's incidentally why they call Web3 the read, write, own web, uh, because it adds this level of ownership of control to the experience of being an internet user. And then the final thing is freedom to transact, basically economic freedom. Like in the same way that, you know, you can do business between individuals, between companies and across state lines in the United States, um, you should be able to conduct business and do transactions peer to peer or peer to uh, you know, to another company and move between the state lines of the metaverse, right? Right now we have this federated metaverse where we've got all these different environments controlled by big companies, but you should be able to, to move goods and value, goods in the virtual sense, between these different environments seamlessly. And currently that doesn't exist either. So to me, like I'm just very concerned that whatever we get in these virtual worlds and experiences will do very little to push humanity forward. All it's really going to do is to, I don't know, perpetuate the web two economic model, um, but do so in, with virtual reality. And to me, that would be selling the vision short. So I hope that we can get some of this right. And the good news is that there's a lot of web three metaverse um, platforms and protocols that are trying to do exactly that. Now, this idea of uh, owning uh, via property rights is historically been something that creates massive prosperity for um, uh, many societies uh, and civilizations. Yeah, when definitely. we think about it in a digital form, we're giving property rights, not necessarily to some societies that don't have it. In the United States, we have property rights, but now we're giving it in a different form factor in this kind of digital yeah. world. And so how important are individual borders, uh, nationalities, uh, or even maybe like the differences between you and I, when we get into a digital world, you know, one of the things I've always thought about is on a blockchain, we're all just kind of a random string of letters and numbers. And so uh, talk a little yeah. bit as to like, yes, you're giving property rights, but the quote unquote receiver of the property rights now looks much more um, like the other uh, people in that, you know, kind of ecosystem or that market participant. And the reason why that becomes interesting is like with the rise of automation and machines, you can very quickly see they are going to be transacting in these digital assets. And so yeah. now all of a sudden you're giving property rights, not just to people, but you may be giving them to machines as well. And the blockchain or these assets don't know the difference, whether it's a human or it's a machine. All they know is they're moving from one wallet to another wallet based on whatever the market participant is doing. Today's episode is brought to you by Base. Base is making it their mission to bring a billion people on chain. What exactly is Base? It's a layer two offering a seamless experience for both builders and users. With near zero gas fees and rapid transaction speeds, Base is shaping the future of the on-chain world. Base is a canvas for everyone with hundreds of apps in the ecosystem, whether you're an emerging creator, a seasoned developer, or someone exploring the on-chain space for the first time. Base is designed to bring your ideas to life. So if you're looking for a platform where the future of on-chain is being built daily, Base is your destination. Join in and make on-chain the next online. Learn more at base.org or follow along on Twitter at buildonbase. Again, that's at buildonbase to see cool things to do on-chain every single day.
Yeah. Well, geez, that's a really fascinating kind of idea and, th and thought experiment. Um, you know, people have property rights. You're you're right. But other other entities have property rights, uh, like corporations have property rights and, and corporations have legal personhood. So um, to me, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that you can have uh, not inanimate objects or devices that have the same kinds of property rights as as individuals do. I mean, let's say you had a self-driving car that uh, was self-owned because it could earn money from the fares that it generated. Um, if it was incorporated as a legal person, which it could be, right, then it could have property rights in the same way that like a company or an individual had. Um, so I think that it's a strange, I don't know where we're headed exactly. Um, I love that idea. And I think it's it's one that probably is going to come to a head, not just from a technology perspective, but from a legal perspective and a philosophical perspective as well. But um, your other point was another one that I find e equally fascinating. You know, in the introduction to my new book, I basically said that, say that, you know, technology, uh, they say that technology makes the world a flatter place, right? That the spread of technology improves access to global markets, uh, access to opportunities, and so on and so forth. Thomas Friedman said that, you know, the world is flat. Uh, the reality, of course, is that the world today is not flat. Um, the world is deeply divided and unequal, but it is true that technology has made it uh, much more connected than ever before. So my view basically is that, yeah, technology makes the world a flatter place, then Web3 is gonna be a steamroller. It's gonna flatten the world in ways that we scarcely imagined, right? Like the internet, the first era of the internet, Internet, um, web one and web two, uh, democratized access to information and uh, democratized the ability to publish, right? To share information, your thoughts, your ideas, and so forth. Those are pretty revolutionary concepts. What web three does is it democratizes access to ownership. Ownership um, where maybe to your point, those rights may not exist in the legal uh, sense in the places where those people live. Let's say you live in a country where there's a dictator who can expropriate your assets, but on chain and in the in Web three, um, you have a program programmatic right to ownership. Now, I think like, not to get too philosophical, but the political does supersede the the technological in certain contexts. Like if someone knocks on your door and you know demands your private keys, or they'll throw you in jail for the rest of your life, then you start to see the power of the state uh, monopoly on violence. But in general, the idea that we have a way to express property rights digitally is incredibly powerful. And I think that we are entering a period in time where there's going to be access to opportunity in a way that has not existed previously. I think of DAOs as a really interesting example of this, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, in, in Web3 and, and DeFi and some of these other areas, a lot of organizations begin first as these internet native entities, right? I don't want to call them companies, but in some respects, they kind of function like companies. But the difference is that with a company, you know, Delaware C Corp, if you're a startup, you might be able to access stock or offer stock to like your best employees or maybe everyone who goes to work for your company. But there's no easy way to cut your users, your vendors, your partners, contributors, and so forth, uh, as cut them into the ownership of the of that platform. And with DAOs, you can. Like if you wanted to start a, a software project today and make it available in 50 countries and make it so that anybody who used it could access ownership, you know, over time, as the, the more they use it, the more they earn because they're adding value to the network. They're helping the network effects to scale. Um, how would you do that today with a company? Like you couldn't. You'd have to have, you know, legal agreements in place in 50 countries and translate them into 20 languages. And you'd have to have lawyers enforcing the terms and so forth. But with tokens, with a, with a DAO, you can create an easy way for users of a platform to earn ownership in the form of a token. And that token can have, you know, a governance rights to say in how that platform is run. It can have economic upside. It could pay uh, distributions. You know, I've seen lots of really novel uh, concepts in practice where as a token holder, you can receive, you know, stablecoin dividends from the out output of a certain network. All of that, um, I think, creates lots of questions and challenges from a legal and regulatory perspective. But the technology tools exist and are in practice today. And I just think that that is something that's really exciting because the web is global, web three is global, duh, because it's all part of the same thing. And now we've got a toolkit that allows anybody to participate, but also to uh, share in the wealth that is created. So we had a way for everyone to participate, to share information, to access information. Now we have a way to share and access and 
the value creation. And to me, that more than anything else is the most powerful concept of Web3. What is the thing you believe is most likely to occur that most people do not yet think is going to happen? Whether it is AI related, crypto, AR, VR, like we look out into the future, you have very high conviction, but you know the rest of the market uh, does not. Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. You know, I think that what people don't fully appreciate, like people talk about tokenizing the world and, you know, how we can put, put real world assets into tokens. Like my view is that most economic activity will happen on blockchains. You know, most transactions, most assets are already are going to be uh, internet native or on chain assets. And look, some of those things are not that's not possible. Like there are physical assets in the real world where what you're putting on chain is sort of title to those assets. But in a lot of other senses, that's really not the case. Like if you look at stocks and bonds, like I do return to finance because it's an area that I'm comfortable with and I've known my whole life. But like the, the global stock market, you know, combined has a market value of $100 trillion. Those assets aren't claims on some physical assets. They're claims on ownership of, of cash flows that a company pays out. They're a contract. They are le a legal fiction, right? And, and assets like stocks and bonds and, and other uh, financial assets, securities, all of those things can be represented as on-chain assets. So I just think that today, like the, the and, and I also think that's part one. And then moving forward, a lot of, as I alluded to in the last answer, I think a lot of future kinds of companies and projects and organizations will begin themselves as digitally native, right? Where they won't have a foot in the real world where there's like, you know, a stock that trades on the exchange and then some, you know, version of it that trades on chain, everything will be on chain. And so to me, like, where are we, where are we going? We're going to a world where there's hundreds of trillions of dollars of assets um, that, that uh, exist on blockchains and transact on blockchains. And it's like, the, re the question is like, well, why? Well, the reason why is that they're just better. <laughs> um, it's instant, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's real-time, um, it's auditable, searchable, um, and it offers more flexible kinds of organizational structures, right? Tokens are, as I said earlier, kind of like websites in the sense that they can be programmed to represent anything. Um, I've heard an interesting analogy that tokens are like containers for information, right? Or, or containers for value. So in the same way a shipping container can contain furniture and clothing and computer parts, a token can be programmed to contain anything. And because it's programmable, it means it can represent an almost infinite number of configurations. In the same way, like a website can be an infinite number of things, right? It can be, you know, where you access the sports scores, but on also your social media page, it can be, you know, a government health website, whatever. So um, to me, the idea that, the world will be tokenized. It's become a cliche, but it's something that, that I've had high conviction on um, since day one. What is the thing that everyone is excited about that you think they should not be or they are overvaluing will happen in the future? <laughs> um, geez, that's a really interesting question. I'm I'm not sure that anybody is overhyping anything right now. And that's not because I'm sort of Pollyannish and I think all of this stuff is great. Um, I think that probably today what, what i find really interesting about the moment that we're in and i mentioned you know blockchain ai um extended reality and iot is that they all seem to be hitting an inflection point at roughly the same time in innovation there's like in theory there's this concept known as an s curve right which i know i know you're familiar with we're basically in the early days it's a lot of capital and time that goes into developing a new technology but there's relatively little economic output but then at a certain point, it hits an inflection point where for every unit of time and unit of capital, it creates a, an, an exponential amount of economic growth. All of these technologies that I've discussed are all basically, you know, hitting this inflection point. They're all overnight success stories that are many decades in the making, right? People talk about this with blockchains. You know, when are we going to get more real world use cases? When are hundreds of millions of people going to use this? You know, blockchains have only been around for like 15 years, really. If you look at these other technologies, they've been around for decades. You know, AI began with Alan Turing and the Turing test, you know, 19, the 1940s and 50s predates the transistor. Uh, the vir virtual reality, extended reality, there have been examples of that throughout history going back to the 1970s and 80s, you know, connected devices, the idea of, you know, an internet of things, and again, a concept that is many decades old. But all of these things are ideas whose time have finally come again, and they're all converging at the exact same time. So to me, like the tech, the tech hype is real. What I think people are probably under appreciating or maybe undervaluing is the potential both for 
uh, positive, uh, like the, the ability for these technologies to unlock an era of human flourishing and productivity and prosperity, but also the downside of it as well. Like, I think that as a species, we are not ready for a world where 99% of content is synthetic and where deep fakes are photorealistic and where, you know, you can get a call from a friend or a loved one saying they've been kidnapped with a deep fake video of them holding today's newspaper. And it's all bullshit, B BS, excuse my uh, French, but it's like, you know, are we ready for a world? How do we figure that out? How do we prove identities? How do we prove data? How do we prove humanness? Like all of those challenges, I think that we're so far away from figuring that out, but like the technology is accelerating at a at an ex ex exponential rate. And so like, we're not gonna have time to figure this stuff out. And I think that's gonna create a lot of chaos in the world. But at the same time, I think that all of these things taken together um, can help to bring humanity to a, a new level of prosperity that we have not enjoyed or experienced so far. So, you know, you take the good with the bad. You mentioned chaos in the world. And one of the things that uh, seems to be developing is that on chain in the digital world, there's a lot of certainty you understand when the blocks will be created. You can uh, cryptographically prove certain things have occurred. Uh, there's not a lot of debate. It's very binary, like either one or zero, it happened or it didn't. Yeah. Um, the exact opposite is like accelerating in uh, the off-chain world. There's way more uncertainty. There's way more chaos that feels like things are becoming uh, less uh, structured and, and predictable. And so – do you feel like those will continue to pull away from each other or can the on-chain world actually pull the off-chain world back towards a kind of cleaner, predictable, certain future? Well, you've, I think, really neatly described the potential to bring a whole bunch of certainty to this area that is exploding in growth and becoming more uncertain. And I, I could take that question in several different directions. Like, obviously, the world, I think, appears to be getting more unstable, um, you know, trust in our institutions is collapsing. People are living in self-reinforcing echo chambers where the you know purpose of news is not to inform, but to provide comfort, like all that is happening. But I think like in, when it comes to tech specifically, the question is what is the risk or challenge posed by, by AI? You know, how do we determine or prove humanness in a world where um, you know, deep fakes and synthetic content uh, can recreate a person from the perspective of another with a high degree of certainty? And how do we prove that an, an AI model is sourcing the correct data? And how do we assure that if that data is owned, if it's IP owned by someone, that they are receiving uh, recognition and compensation for that work? And all of the, you know, and I could go on and on, but like in all of these cases, there is this disconnect, as you point out, between this proliferation of activity, but it needing to be anchored in truth. And I think that to be able to figure out how and trust, truth and trust, like how do we trust that the data is accurate? How do we know, how can we prove the truth of who owns it and so forth? And I think that's where the, um, the, the synthesis or the convergence of these technologies is going to occur. But like, it's not a it's not like they're on a collision course and this is going to happen no matter what, right? Like technology doesn't just work and it doesn't just create positive outcomes. It's a tool that can be wielded by people who have good intentions and bad intentions. It can have positive and negative, you know, societal, economic, cultural um, outputs. And so it really depends on how it's wielded. So if there's anything that, that I want to um, sort of leave readers with, with the new book, it's that this is a new economic and cultural frontier. Uh, like all frontiers, it's got its fair share of risks as well as rewards. Uh, and like any frontier, it's populated by some of the most ambitious and smart and brilliant people, but also by a fair share of, of hucksters and criminals and, you know, ne'er-do-wells. And um, it comes with, with its fair share of pratfalls. And so if you're going to enter into this new frontier, if you want to help to lead this next era, you need a guide, uh, you know, and that's what I hope the book does. But I also want people to leave you know, reading, having read the book, feeling like leadership is their personal opportunity. I, I think it's pretty obvious now at this point that leadership doesn't come from the top down in, in the economy. It comes from the bottom up or the outside in. You know, it's not just random guy in the street, but like entrepreneurs, innovators, users, first movers can come from anywhere. And I think with Web3, they can also be anywhere in the world. And I think that that's something that 
should feel really empowering for people. Like if you feel the world's moving quickly, you want to play a role in it. I think there are ways to do that. But I, again, like I think that to go back to the original question, you know, these things don't just happen on their own, right? They require people to actually take the reins um, and to steer the technology and to steer our culture in the right direction. Now, when this comes to fruition, how does regulation play into it? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's a question that I, I chuckle just because how much time do you have? You know, I mean, I think it's it's a very fascinating and challenging area, right? So within the world of um, you know financial services, for example, something like a stable coin. So even a stable coin, which has you know shown clear product market fit and is widely used and it's clearly providing a real utility to people is an area that's deeply contentious and you know for those who understand the the business model of stable coins i'll just explain it really briefly so stable coins are minted when people deposit cash on hand with the institution that mints the stable coin um and that can mean basically that they're sitting on billions of dollars of value of money which they go and invest into government securities now, what would be really great is if the holder of the stablecoin could receive the interest that the collateral earns from the treasuries and other assets that the issuer buys. But right now they can't because if they did that, it would be like a security. And because it's a security, then it falls under a whole other suite of regulation. But the, the upshot of that is that the people who use this asset can't actually participate in the full value of it, right? And I know that seems like kind of an arcane example, but you're talking about billions of dollars of, of interest income that people can't participate in because of regulatory uncertainty, right? So that's like one tiny example amongst many. I think the biggest, one of the big sticking points Points. And I, I talked about that DAO example is that it would be great to be able to launch a project from scratch and to make it available to anyone to use and to earn ownership in. And the more you interact with a platform, the more value you create, the more you earn. But as a practical matter, you know, what are people actually owning? A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, founders go to great pains to point out that their tokens are not securities. But in my view, um, there's a lot of elements of them that are. And I actually think that's a really positive thing. The idea that you can have ownership of something and participate in the upside if it creates value. And as a user, be you know a stakeholder in how it's run and governed, to me is an amazing concept. But the legal and regulatory infrastructure for DAOs just does not exist. And I think that that, more than anything, more than the technology, is the biggest uh, cap on its, on its development and on its growth, right? So... Um, on the other hand, there are many examples where regulation is useful uh, or or necessary, and I think it's because I think the first two examples are ones where a lack of clarity has led to um, value not being created. I think there are other examples where uh, it can be created. Now, I think that figuring out the balance between these two things is uh, very very tricky, and I think that it's something that at least in the United States today. There isn't enough serious discussion happening about how to set the conditions or to lay the foundations for this next era of the web to succeed. And I think as a result, that makes it uh, an economic opportunity that could be lost or forfeited just through inaction. Like the, the web, web three, inclusive of all these other technologies, it's the US is to lose. Like, come on, you got all the tech, you got all the capital, you've got the universities, you've got all of this going for you. But if you don't create the regulatory framework, then money and assets and organizations are gonna move offshore. And that's what's already happening today. So I think that there are opportunities for governments to take a proactive role in helping to accelerate um, the adoption and to accelerate capital formation and accelerate um, innovation. Um, but it requires the political will to do it. And I think in some parts of the world, that political will is there, and in others, it's not yet. When we view um, the future, as you're describing it, one of the questions that uh, I think we can end on is, are people skilled and trained in a way that can make it happen? And what I mean by that is like some of these technologies are new, and so we've seen a huge, uh, you know, in the crypto world, solidity. Right, all these people have to go and and kind of get up to speed on certain technologies. Um, but is the workforce prepared to build this? 
or do we just need time to pass? And a lot of younger people who grew up with these technologies and it's more inherent uh, and it's less about retraining the existing workforce and it's more about the new workforce growing up. Um, you know, an easy example is growing up with a cell phone is very different than learning it at 40 or 45. Um, yeah. and, and so how do you think about like the workforce's ability to build this stuff? Well, I think I have a lot of faith in, in humanity to uh, embrace a new technology. Um, you know, Luddites notwithstanding, as a species, that's the thing that separates us from everybody, <laughs> from everyone else, everyone else meaning other creatures on this planet, is our ability to use tools. And what are tools if not technology? Um, you know, whether it's, you know, a primitive hand axe or a personal computer, it's a form of technology that enhances and augments human ability. So I do think that that people will adapt that much, I'm sure of. But I also think that technology innovation can sometimes be uh, the vanguard of deeper cultural, social, economic upheaval. And I think that for leaders of today, uh, that's something that scares them, <laughs> that it's not so much that they need to learn how to use solidity, it's that this technology might shake the foundations of their reality, that it might lead to their organization being disrupted or their role in the workforce changing. You know, back in the 1970s and 80s, they said that personal computers would never take off. And the reason for that was that managers would never learn how to type. Typing was something that secretaries did. And so what did they mean by that? It wasn't just that managers wouldn't learn how to type or managers wouldn't, you know, developers wouldn't learn how to use Solidity. It was that by learning how to type, they were doing women's work, right? This was challenging the, the sort of um, status quo of this, of this sort of sexist stratified workplace that had existed until then. So that's something I, I think has been true forever, which is that new technology can act as this harbinger of, of deep, deep structural change in the world. And it's that more than the ability to adopt new skills or to prepare the labor force that I think creates this resistance, creates this um, ambivalence from a lot of people about embracing new technology. It's not that they're afraid of learning a new skill, it's that they worry that whatever status they have in the world could change. Now, some people are really comfortable with that. They're comfortable with change. I think a lot of entrepreneurs and founders um, are like that, but most people are not. You know, they seek uh, comfort in stability. And so I think that that's something that as a society, we have to keep in mind for sure. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find the books? Yeah, well, the book again is called Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural Frontier. It's been out for a few months. It's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. You can buy it on Amazon or wherever you get books. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Alex Tapscott. Um, love to continue this conversation online. Alex, I appreciate it as always. I've uh, I learned a ton today and you've made me think more deeply about stuff. So I really hope that people uh, listen to this and, and they get as much value out of it as I did. And we we'll definitely do it again in the future.